All right, open your Bibles to the 65th Psalm, the 65th Psalm. And if you don't have a Bible, but you'd like to use one, just raise your hand. Someone will bring you one that you can either borrow or keep. It's our gift to you, or you can take your smart device, open up the version or the Bible app. And if your location services are enabled, we'll pop up automatic like. Otherwise, click on the more button in the bottom right-hand corner and a little search bar will pop up, put Life Church Green Bay in there and all the notes and scriptures, everything you'll see behind me have already been uploaded. If you're watching us live on our online campus or at one of our services at the Brown County Correctional Facility, love you guys so much. So glad you're part of our family. If you are here live, would you clap for those who couldn't be here today? So I hope it comes across, like I love my job. Like it's fun to watch people who love their job. And I, man, I love my job. I'm so grateful that God picked me to do this, that he, he could have picked me to do anything that he wanted to pick me to do. But by the grace of him, he picked me to do this. And so I'm super grateful for it. And I love it. And this, this is one of the parts that I, I, I really love. But uh, one of the most stressful parts of my job is deciding what it is that we're gonna talk about every week. And like, there's so much in here that I wanna talk about, but the real question is, what am I supposed to talk about? Like, there's nothing in here that I don't love talking about, but there's just been something special to me that I've, I've really personally connected and personally really loved, enjoyed writing these messages. I've loved this series that we're in. It's it's. It's like just something about it that's just grabbed the hold of my heart because really, I really love telling people who they are. And not like in the way you grew up telling people who they are, like in a negative way, like you are a dirty, low down, you know, not that way. And, you know, partly because that's really easy. It's really easy to say ugly, mean, negative things to people, but mostly because it's just mean. And I don't like to be a mean guy. I spent enough of my life being a mean guy pre-Jesus that I felt like let's not waste any more time being a mean guy post-Jesus. And so what I really want to do is I like to tell people who they are in a positive way or an empowering way, partly because that's counterintuitive to what most of us typically hear, but mostly because when I do that, it makes me more like Jesus. If you want to be more like Jesus, just start small by saying really nice things to people. Because, you know, Jesus never speaks death over anyone. Anything or anyone that speaks death over you, that it's, that's not Jesus speaking. That, and to be honest, anyone uh, who says negative things to you or about you or over you, like they're actually breaking the second commandment and they're taking the name of the Lord in vain or they're misusing God's name. So I want to take the few minutes that I get up here every week saying nice things to you and about you. I don't want to spend the little bit of time that is allotted to me to tell you everything that you're doing wrong, partly because you already know that. If you didn't know you were doing things wrong, most of you, you, you wouldn't be here. So I want to spend the little bit of time that we get together every week speaking life over you, which is why I really like this series. Because I wanted you to know without a doubt, we are glad you're here. Like, you could be anywhere right now. And so we don't take it lightly that you would choose to spend these moments with us, that you, you could be doing anything, being anywhere. You could be fishing right now. I mean, there's hundreds of boats in the Fox River right now. We drove by the river on the way here this morning really early, and there was already, you know, a, a hundred boats in the water and another hundred people waiting to put in. And most of them are probably watching us online. I say that by faith. Uh, and so not only are we glad that you're here, we're really glad that you're there. And there is like in your neighborhood, at your job, in your family, at your school. We're glad that you can kind of take what it is that you got here and you can like graft it into where it is uh, that you are there. And so we also wanted to remind you of a couple of things that society has tried to take away from you. Like we wanted you to remember that you are generous that you are kind. And so today I want to kind of continue speaking life over you by talking about something that might seem a bit counterintuitive by sharing a message that we're calling, we are humble. Let's pray. God, we love you. We humbly submit ourselves to you. 
We, we say that, God, what it is that you want is definitely what it is that we want. God, if what it is that we want isn't what it is that you want, we want you to rewire what it is that we want so that it lines up with what you want. God, I want to be less like me today, and I want to be more like you. And so do that, please. I ask you, I don't have to, but I acknowledge that I give you permission to rework me, to rewire me in Jesus' name. Amen. And so when you think about like personality traits or characteristics, I, I think that sometimes, at least in our Western culture, humility has gotten a bad rap. I don't think we talk about it often enough in the positive light that it deserves because somehow humility has become a synonym for weakness. L like you have to be a Tibetan monk or Mother Teresa to be humble. And if you tell people that you're humble, well, <laughs> you're automatically not humble. <laughs> but humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's interesting in the book of Numbers, Moses, the great patriarch, actually said he was the most humble person on earth, which is a bit awkward when you read that. But what made it more awkward is that he said it in the third person. Because anytime people talk in the third person, it's a bit weird to me. And so like Moses wrote these words, Moses is the most humble person on earth. And I read that and I thought, ha, that doesn't seem that humble. But it'll help you to understand that humility doesn't manifest itself in weakness. Humility manifests itself in strength. If you're humble, you are strong. That, that's not my opinion. The apostle or Saint Peter said, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. And so if you're in humility, it's inevitable. Eventually you'll be in honor, but humility is intentional. It doesn't just happen by chance. It happens one of two ways. It either happens by choice or by crash. No one is accidentally humble. Like you're either intentionally humble. No, no one is accidentally humble. You're either intentionally humble or you're intentionally humbled. You choose which way you want to get there. But you don't have to be squashed or smashed or small to be humble. Humility does not equal failure. You know, you can be really humble and really successful. You're not humble because you lack ability. You're humble because you lack arrogance. Humility is confidence in action. It's being full of the right spirit. Every one of us has a spirit that we're full of. The question is, is it the right spirit or is it the wrong spirit? Not acknowledging your abilities or allowing other people to acknowledge your abilities, that isn't humility, that's insecurity. Like I've met a lot of people who thought that they were humble, but really they were just insecure. And guess what? God's not down with that. God is not down with insecurity. Like I want my kids to be humble, but I don't want them to be insecure. And so because of that, I try to teach them to receive compliments and not reject compliments. Just say thank you and move on. Because being able to receive compliments will go a long way in helping you be able to reject criticism. For example, if somebody comes up to my daughter, Aubrey, and says like, yeah, you're a really good singer. She should just say thank you and move on. Do you know why? Because she's a really good singer. And whether she wants to admit it publicly or not, inside she knows that she's a really good singer. And the reason that she's a really good singer is because it's a gift that God gave her. And it's a gift that he gave her to display, not to deny or dispute. Like if you gave your friend a gift, but when somebody turned around and complimented that gift and it made your friend feel uncomfortable, so they dismissed the grandeur of the gift that you gave them, how would that make you feel? That's not humble, that's hurtful. Deflecting a compliment isn't humility, it's insulting, it's insecurity. And insecurity isn't enduring, it isn't from God, it's offensive. And it, like it's offensive to God and it's offensive to everybody else who sees it and hears it. Like, like how do you think it makes less talented people feel when they hear more talented people say they're not talented? Do you think it makes them feel hopeful, full of hope? Or do you think it makes them feel hopeless, like there's less hope for them? I'm not trying to give people less hope. I'm trying to see people filled 
with hope. And so God didn't say, blessed are the insecure, for they will inherit the earth. He actually said that he blesses those who are humble, and those are the people who are going to inherit the earth. The unfortunate thing about insecure people is that they make everything, including God, small. Insecure people think that everyone and everything, including God, is against them. They, I would say like this. They have that Eeyore spirit, you know, from Winnie the Pooh. Woe is me. I may as well go eat worms and die. You know, it's like the guy from Peanuts who has the, like, the storm thing over his head at all times. Like, that person who it could be sunny and 78, and you're like, well, but it might rain next week. And you're like, really? Can we just be happy about what's happening right now? Insecure people think that God doesn't want them to be successful or prosperous, but the only people who don't want you to be successful or prosperous are other insecure people. And so if you're surrounded by people who are constantly pushing you down, you need to ask yourself, what are they so insecure about? Like me, I want everybody to prosper. I want all of you to get raises this week. I want all of you to get promotions this week. I want you all to lose 10 pounds. I want you to grow your hair back. I want your pants to look like they're not wrinkled. Like I want all of you to prosper. I want everyone in this room to succeed, but that's because I'm humble. And I can say that because I'm secure in my humility. Now, I haven't always been like that. Like I used to be jealous of Everybody, like uh, p particularly people who, who do what I do. Like uh, anytime somebody would come to me and say that they really like such and such a preacher, then I would like get, you know, kind of sideways about it. Well, yeah, like you don't know them. Like, I mean, if you knew what they were really like, I hadn't met them. But, you know, if you, if you knew what they were, if you knew their marriage, I mean, you know he's got an alcohol problem. I mean, I didn't say that. But, you know, like, I was lying. I was totally making stuff up. But because it made me feel small, I wanted to make that other person look small. But what I discovered is that your success doesn't diminish my success and so now I'm secure enough to speak success over people. Like, for example, my wife, Pastor Sonny, is a far better natural leader than me. She's just wired that way. Like, there are certain things that, like, I'm good at. Like, I actually don't, I've been saying this for a year, I don't even want to lead this place. I just want to get up here and talk. Like, I, I want her to lead it because she's really good at that. Like, when God was handing out stuff and people were in heaven pulling the number from the little red wheel thing, she got four of your number. And she just got all of the leadership stuff. And I, I love it. And it, like, it doesn't bother me that that happens. Because why would I think that pushing that down in her would push anything up in me? My brother-in-law, Brian, the guy with the sweet beard who has the cool boots on today, who is like leading worship and doing the singing thing, like he's a better singer than me. And saying that doesn't make me look small. It just points out how big of a talent I think he is because I can sing. Like if you don't know me, I don't sing. I'm a singer. Like, and so I can sing but I just think that he can sing better. And that doesn't make me look worse. That doesn't make me a bad leader because I think Sonny's a better leader. It doesn't make me a bad singer because I think Brian is a better singer. But what saying that about them, or better yet, what I'm not good at is saying that to them, is that that should promote and propel them. It should fill them with hope. Humble people have no problem helping others become hopeful people. Like, I am fully aware of the fact that there are all sorts of people in here who do lots of stuff way better than me. And it's fine. I, for example, my, my friend Scott, he's an amazing realtor. I couldn't sell you a house. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to open the lockbox. I don't know. I'll just break the window. I could get you in the house. Let's start with that. But you don't want to buy that house after I after I got you in. My friend uh, Chris, my friend Chris is here. Uh, 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 I don't know his last name, but it's like Wolf Singer or... Uh, wait, wave your... I'm going to embarrass people today. Wave your arm, Chris. Chris is an incredible chef. He's, oh my gosh. He makes food make your tongue want to evict your teeth. It's amazing. And you don't want me to cook for you because it'd be bad news. My friend Nikki right here, she's an amazing mom. She's an incredible mom. How do I know that? Because I know her daughter. I've met her daughter, and her daughter's the bomb. And so I go like, hey, she's, she's an amazing mom. In fact, all of you are better moms than me. 
Let's just start there. But you get my point. My friends, Jim and Yang, they're amazing business people. They're way better business people than I am. And like the list could go on and on. My friend Josh is an amazing mechanic. Wave your hand, Josh. He's fixed like everything I own. He's an amazing mechanic. If you want, your, if you want to get to work tomorrow, don't bring your car to me. Unless you want me to pray over it. But Josh is uh, he's amazing at it. And so like is, is like, is me acknowledging that, does that make me less at anything or does it make them more at it? Like it shouldn't make me feel awkward to say that and it shouldn't make them feel awkward to hear that. The only thing that would make them or make me feel awkward is the wrong voice that you should be listening to. It's a voice of insecurity. And God doesn't want us to live in insecurity. And so deflecting acknowledgement of your gifts isn't godly, and it doesn't make you look better. It makes God feel sad, you look silly, and the rest of us feel small. So before I give you my steps to becoming more humble, I have a little exercise that I want you to do. So we took uh, three by five cards, and we put them on your chairs before you got in here. And so here's what that's for. I want you to take that three by five card and I want you to write your first name and your last name. And I want you to write something that you're really good at. And then I want you to either put that in the offering when it comes around at the end or want you to take it out to the Welcome Center. And here's the deal. We're not gonna do anything with it. We're not gonna like send you emails or try to recruit you unless on the cards you write you're really good at giving millions of dollars and I'll call you this afternoon. <laughs> just saying. I'm just kidding, but I will. Put, if, if that's you, put your phone number. And so, like, I, I don't have any reason for you to do that, uh, except it's your way of publicly getting rid of your insecurity and graciously acknowledging a gift that God has given you. Think of it as a little thank you note to Jesus, okay? Anyway, you don't write that while I'm talking. You'll have time when Pastor Dallas is taking the offering to write that. And so, uh, I want to help you by giving you six steps to becoming more humble. Here's the first. Number one, ask for feedback. True humility requires an accurate view of yourself. The book of Proverbs says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man, he listens to advice. I like how another version says it. It says, stupid people always think they're right. <laughs> I love it. I just think that's great. Some of you may think that stupid is a cuss word in your house, but it's in the Bible. So stupid people Stupid people are, are, they think they're always right, but wise people, they listen to advice. Like, get advice, but not from everybody, okay? Like, find a few close friends who you can trust who will be really honest with you and get their advice. Like, uh, my best friend is a guy named Alan, and he's preached here before, and you know him, and he's, a, he's, a, he's just a great guy. And about 15 years ago, Sonny and I were having a difficulty in our marriage because she was humble and I wasn't. And so I was sick and I was in the hospital and I had some surgery. And when I woke up from the surgery, to my surprise, there was my friend Alan at the end of my bed. And he said, hey, bro, how you feeling? Hey, just flew in to let you know that I think if you don't become a better husband, you and I can't be friends because I don't run around with people who aren't like me. I was like, well, dang. You know, you could have called me, right? <laughs> like, you didn't fly here to say that? He said, no, nah, I wouldn't have had the same power if I would have called you. I wanted you to know that I love you enough to make an investment in our relationship. You need to find some people who love you enough to invest in your relationship with truth and positivity. So I want you to find like some friends, a couple really close people, and ask them three things that they appreciate about you because it's always good to, to start with the positive, and then three areas where you could use some growth. Ask for feedback. Here's the second step to becoming humble. Confront your prejudices. I want that to hang there because you have them. Everyone has them. For me, it's Bears fans. I don't, I don't, I can't, I, I can't understand. I don't, I'm praying about it. It hasn't worked yet. God says that you have to be long-suffering in your prayers. I'm just kidding. It's not Bears fans. It's Vikings fans. It's, uh, oh, my gosh. Really? You had to get Kirk Cousins and Sheldon Richardson? In Jesus' name, please forgive me. But all joking aside, identify an area of diversity or culture that you struggle with. Who makes you lock your doors or grab your purse? Who makes you shake your head or shake your fist? Most prejudice is caused by ignorance. 
And contrary to popular belief, ignorance is not bliss. For some people, their prejudice isn't about race or religion, it's about region. You can't be humble and dislike people just because of what part of the world or the country they're from. They could not control where they were born or what their traditional garb is required to be. For some people, their prejudice is a person's age or income level, the level of their education or their intelligence, but humility requires harmony. Again, not my opinion. Scripture says, live in harmony, be sympathetic, love each other, have compassion, and be humble. What if you took your prejudices, put them to the side, and found somebody from a group that you don't feel particularly comfortable around and asked them for coffee? And you ask them for coffee with an intention to listen and learn, to look for areas where the two of you can agree rather than for areas where the two of you can argue. You'd be amazed at what that conversation will teach you about you. I promise you it'll be humbling. Here's the third step to becoming humble is start with a question. Jesus asked lots of questions even though he knew everything. He knew everything. Isn't it awesome when you can ask people questions that you already know the answer to? Now, Jesus didn't ask them like parents do, like parents. Parents ask questions that kids, when your parents ask you certain questions, they already have the answer. <laughs> when they say, did you make your bed or did you pick up your clothes? Did you brush your teeth? They already looked at your bed. They already walked through your bedroom and they already felt your toothbrush. They're just seeing if you'll lie. Or if we want to be positive, they want to... They want to find out if you'll speak in faith. Like you just said, but you're just getting ready to go and do that in Jesus' name. Like you, oh, the bed's not made, but I was on my way to do it. That's not how Jesus asked the questions, except he already knew all the answers. He asked lots of questions because asking questions is empowering to you and to the person you ask. What if you started a conversation with a question instead of a solution? What if you started your next meeting at work with a question instead of a solution? It takes humility to show what you don't know instead of what you do know. The Book of Wisdom says, fools have no desire to learn. Instead, they'd rather give their own opinion. I've learned one good question is worth more than a hundred good answers. Asking questions, creates more oxygen in the room. Questions allow for others to participate, to come together, to create change. Like when you think you already know everything, or at least you act like you already know everything, guess what? Other people are gonna check out and, and things are never going to get solved. Things are never gonna get done. Just because you're really smart in one area doesn't mean you can't admit you're not in another. For example, I have some, some friends, Axel and Kaylin, and they're really good with nutrition. And I'm not. Like, I'm trying to solve this puzzle that is the 40s. Like, something happens when you turn 40, and people tell you about it, and you think it won't happen to me, but it happens. And you turn 40, and suddenly, the treadmill makes you gain weight. You don't, even, you don't understand. Rather than you running on the treadmill, the treadmill runs from you. It's like, mm -mm, no, buddy, I, you were on here last time. I learned something this week that I thought was really interesting. It's definitely going to change my life. Uh, in Middle Eastern culture, it is considered disrespectful and dishonorable for an older man to run. I said Shaka Khan in Jesus' name. I didn't even know I was from the Middle East. You know, I'm, I'm moving there though. That's all I know because I thought, yes, it is disrespectful for an older man to run, especially when you have to watch an older man run. Have you ever seen it? The old man who runs without bending his feet. I'm just saying that there's something about the whole nutrition. I, I can't get it. I've tried no meat. I've tried no carbs. I've tried, it's just so frustrating, but they know all this stuff. And so I've been like sending them questions and asking them and I take a picture. What is this white vegetable? And it's like, you go, I need to learn from you. And just because I know more about one thing than you know about that, you know more about this thing. And taking, uh, qu asking questions takes humility. 
It'll serve you well to remember that nobody likes a know-it-all. Humble people ask questions. Here's the fourth step to becoming humble. Really listen. You can ask all the questions you want, but if you don't listen to the response, it won't do you any good. Listening doesn't obligate you to agree, but it does help you dial down your own pride. Your way isn't the only way of thinking or doing something. When someone shares a thought or an idea, pause, reflect, digest it before you speak. Scripture puts it like this. Listen to advice and accept instruction so that you may gain wisdom in the future. Or, as my grandma used to say, boy, stop all that talking. God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You want to be humble? Listen. Here's the fifth step to becoming humble. Accept setbacks. We are all going to experience them. You're not going to succeed at everything. My pastor used to say, failure is never final. Be a student of setbacks. When something doesn't go your way, what can you learn? Humility allows you to accept challenges without the fear of failure because you know that setbacks are just setups for second chances. And God is the God of second chances. Setbacks are just an opportunity for you to recreate yourself, which scripture says, let the spirit change your way of thinking and make you into a new person. Plus, when you get set back, it just lets God show off. God showed off with the boots. They had a setback, and they thought that their baby was going to be all jacked up. But guess what? God loves showing off on our behalf. And so Scripture tells us to tell our enemies, don't you gloat over me, because though I fall, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Humble people accept setbacks. Here's the sixth step to becoming more humble is discover awe. At some point, every one of us has to come to a realization that there is a God and we're not him. Humility recognizes that you are not the hub of the universe, though like things do not revolve around you. Could we, could we just live with at least a little bit of awe? It should be hard to be self-centered when you're gazing up at the Big Dipper, down at the Grand Canyon, or deep into the eyes of a newborn baby. How can we look at the sun as it rises from the crashing waves of the Atlantic or sets into the expanse of the Pacific and not feel overwhelmed? I want you to look at a picture that I took the other day from my seat on a flight. This, this is the sun rising over the horizon. And, and I apologize that the picture does not even begin to display the majesty of that moment. 95% of the flight was asleep. I looked out the window and was like, God is showing off. He is showing out right now and all the color. And I love the sky. And someday when people gather together to celebrate when I get to go to heaven, people are going to stand around. And I think my kids are going to say, man, dad, love the sky. Because I'm always like, oh my gosh, look at the sky. It's amazing. Oh, look at the sky. They're like, yeah, whatever. I love the sky. Sonny loves water. And so forever from, the, from when they're kids, we used to go anytime we'd see water, it could be a puddle. And Sonny would be like, look, kids, water. And so then like later on, Sonny would say, look, kids. And they'd go, water. And they'd be excited. And then like now, Sonny says, look, kids. And they're like, water. They don't even look anymore. We could be totally tricking them. We could be bait and switching them. But like to Sonny, she's like, oh, it's water. She's like, it loves water. I Love the sky. And when you look at that, if you don't look at that and go, wow, then your wower is broke. There's something wrong. And you look at that. Okay, so I thought, well, this may not. It, I knew that this wouldn't impress some of you because you're a tough crowd. So, so I brought a second picture, and I want you to look at this. <laughs> Do you realize what you're looking at? That's a whole row of horse and buggies. I, don't, I took that picture myself. I, I, I went to a, to a seminar this week in Ohio, uh, Jewish studies 
seminar. And I didn't know till I got there that it was the Amish seminar taught by a guy about Jewish. And I walked in, I was the only non-Amish guy in there. It was awesome. The only thing I wanted, I wanted to put a black hat on and blend in. But I came around the corner and I saw this. And this is Friday night in Millersburg, Ohio. This is date night. This is a drive-in the This is a drive-in theater without a movie screen. This is like, I came around the corner and was late for the festival because I had to turn around because it's not every day you see. Because if you go this way, there's 20 more. My phone just couldn't fit them all in. And I looked at that and I had to try to text Sonny. I said, are you kidding me right now? I actually took a picture while I was driving of a, a horse and buggy coming downhill while I was going uphill. It was the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. The horse looked terrified. It's like, <laughs> he couldn't keep up. He's like, there's something following me right now. It's been trying to run me over for 40 miles. It was the greatest thing ever. And if you look at something like that and you go, that's not awesome. There's something wrong with your view of awe. Because the word awesome just means there is some awe involved in that. And for me, I come around the corner and I go, oh. I'm probably never going to see that again. And at some point, we've got to come to a place of awe. William Beebe was an explorer and a friend of President Theodore Roosevelt. He often would visit him in the White House. And when he visited him, they had this practice that they would go outside after dark and they would stand and they would look at the sky and see who could be the first one to locate the Andromeda galaxy. They would gaze out into the sky at the tiny smudges of distant starlight until one of them finally saw it. And whoever was the first one to see it would recite these words. That's the spiral galaxy of Andromeda. It's as large as our Milky Way. It's one of 100 million galaxies. It's 750,000 light years away and consists of 100 billion suns, each of which is larger than our own. After those words, after that thought sunk in, President Roosevelt would flash his toothy grin. He'd say, well, friend, now I think we're small enough. Let's go to bed. The writer of the 65th Psalm said it like this, they who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. Y'all, I used to act like things were no big deal, like Sonny and I would go somewhere, like a really nice hotel, and Sonny, being Sonny, would go, oh, isn't this beautiful? And me, being me, I would go, it's I. Right. Are you kidding me? That's a chandelier, are you kidding me? I mean, we could be at the Taj Mahal, and Sonny would go, oh, it's beautiful, and I go, I thought it'd be shinier. <laughs> it's one of the seven wonders of the world. Like, are you kidding me? That's insecurity. That's a ghetto kid who can't admit that he needs to be humbled. Listen, God himself looked at what he created with an eye of wonder. It says he looked at all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And the older I get, the less I wanna be like me, it's I. And the more I wanna be like him, it is very good. I want my life to echo the words of the prophet Habakkuk who said, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. Like Roosevelt, I want my life to say, I think we're finally small enough. I want my life to scream, God, you are big and I am small. Because after 44 years, I've never felt more willing to obey the words of James, the earthly brother of Jesus, when he said, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up because I want to intentionally humble myself and not be intentionally humbled by him. That's why we are humble. I wonder, are you? Will you close your eyes all across this place? You know, salvation is the ultimate act of humility, both from his part and from our part. It took great humility for him to die the death that he died it takes great humility for us to receive the life that he provides. So I wonder if you're here today and you say, Sean, I have never taken that act of humility and received the gift, the gracious gift called salvation. 
you're here today and you know your life isn't what it needs to be. You know that there's a piece and a part missing. And so I wonder today if you want to deposit that piece, install that piece, receive the humble, gracious gift called Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. And here's how. In just a moment, with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to do two things. First, so in just a moment with nobody looking around, I'm going to ask for people to raise their hand and make eye contact with me. Once you've made eye contact with me, you can put your hand down. And then I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me, along with everyone else in this place. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to center you out. But if you're here, you say, Sean, I want to humbly receive the gracious gift of salvation. Would you raise your hand and make eye contact with me today? Thank you, 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 thanks, thank you, thank you, thank you. Did I miss anybody? Thanks. Thanks, 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 thanks. I'm gonna ask everyone in here to say these words after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I humbly receive your gift of salvation. Change me in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you believed it in your heart, this book, Scripture, says that you are saved, rescued, set free, which means everything you've ever done wrong in your life has been deleted and you start a new journey away from who you are toward who Jesus wants you to be, and that's like Him. We want to walk that journey with you. If you can help us, here's how you can help us help you. Take that card that's in the seat back in front of you or it's underneath your chair, tear off the bottom portion, fill in whatever information you're okay with, check the box that's highlighted in yellow. It says, I'm choosing to follow Jesus. Either put that in the offering when it comes around or take it out to the Welcome Center. We just want the opportunity to pray for you and to follow up with you. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes one more time and don't leave yet because we're not done. Pastor Dallas is gonna close this out here in just a minute. But I wonder if you're here and you say you're like, Sean, I'm saved, I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl. Uh, but you haven't been living your life with that sense of awe. Maybe you haven't been living your life with that like humility that says I need to be less like me and more like him. If that's you and you say, Sean, I, I need to live my life with more humility, but nobody looking around, I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you today. So thank God we love you. For all of my friends in here, I pray blessings and peace. I pray, God, that we would be filled with the right spirit. And that's yours, not ours. In Jesus' name, amen.